two minutes to lay this out without getting into the international relations dimension of things. The focus on the individual and his or her inalienable rights turns liberalism into a universalistic or universalist ideology. There's, in other words, there's this dimension in liberalism that grows out of its emphasis on the individual that makes it universal. What liberalism is saying is that every person on the planet has the same rights. Those rights are universal. They apply to everybody. If you focus on social groups, if you believe that human beings are social animals first and foremost, you end up with a particularist ideology like nationalism. So nationalism doesn't focus on individuals, it focuses on the group. And there is your group, and then there is the other. Right. It's a particularist ideology. That's not what liberalism is all about. Liberalism focuses on the individual. And once you focus on the individual, you quickly end up with a universalist ideology when you throw in inalienable rights. And of course, when you start thinking about liberal hegemony, just to get ahead of myself, when the rights of people outside the borders of the United States are violated, there's a very powerful temptation to go abroad. Now, take this a step further. There are two kinds of political liberalism. Uh, one is classical or modus vivendi liberalism, and the other is modern or progressive liberalism. Uh, I got this distinction mainly from the writings of John Gray. For anybody who's interested, he's written a book called Two Faces of Liberalism, which is an excellent book that lays this out. And Alan Ryan has also written an important essay that lays this out. Uh, so what you have is you have modus, what I call modus vivendi <laughs> liberalism and, and progressive liberalism. And, and these are the two different forms of liberalism that we want to think about. And the story I'm going to tell as we go along here is that progressive liberalism has trumped mod modus vivendi liberalism. We, we, we live in a world where progressive liberalism dominates. And I'll lay that story out. Before I go on to unpacking what modus vivendi liberalism and progressive liberalism are, I just want to say that I distinguish liberalism from utilitarianism and from liberal idealism. Uh, utilitarianism is identified with people like Jeremy Bentham. Uh, and Jeremy Bentham hated the emphasis on inalienable rights. He said it was nonsense. Uh, and utilitarians and liberals tend to be at each other's throats in all sorts of ways. If you look at the debates between Ronald Dworkin and Richard Posner, uh, both famous legal theorists, Dworkin is very much a progressive liberal and Posner is very much a utilitarian and they bark at each other using the language of utilitarian and liberal. Uh, if you look at John Rawls, John Rawls frequently is barking against or barking about uh, utilitarians. So I'm not talking about utilitarians when I talk about liberals. For those of you who do IR in the audience and have read E.H. Carr, E.H. Carr's attack on liberalism, which was written in the 1930s, is an attack on utilitarianism and on liberal idealism. It's not an attack on the liberalism I'm talking about. Carr and I are going after very different targets. Liberal idealism, by the way, is identified with people like T.H. Green and John Dewey. I won't go into any details on what exactly it is, but it's a very different animal than the liberalism I'm talking about. And I'm not saying these two are irrelevant or not worth studying, but not what I'm looking at. I'm looking at progressive liberalism and modus vivendi liberalism, both of which focus in large part on rights. Okay. Now I want to do is, I want to distinguish between these two kinds of liberalism, right? And you want to remember that this is the hardcore. 
So there's no question that both progressives and modus vivendi liberals emphasize those three elements. Now, in distinguishing between the two kinds of liberalism, first point I would make is it's not a difference that's based on reason. There are actually some progressive liberals who make the argument that we can use our critical faculties uh, to figure out questions about the good life. And actually, the piece that comes the closest to making this argument is Francis Fukuyama's very famous piece uh, on the end of history. If you go back and read Francis Fukuyama's piece after listening to my talk tonight, what Francis Fukuyama is basically saying in that piece is that with the end of the Cold War, we've reached the end of history. We're not going to have any more conflict. We're not going to have any more war because we're not going to have any more disagreement on big questions. He's basically saying liberal democracy won, and from here on out, the planet is going to be covered by more and more liberal democracies until we have nothing but liberal democracies. And liberal democracies never have anything to fight over. It's all been settled. That's his argument. But he's really the only person who makes that argument. And if you look at his book, he backtracks in the book. OK? Uh, so uh, my initial inclination when I started studying liberalism was to think that there was a difference between progressive liberals and modus vivendi liberals that involved reason. But I don't believe that anymore. I think there are two big differences. The first big difference is between negative and positive rights and the desirability and efficacy of social engineering. Now you're saying to yourself, what exactly is he talking about? When we talk about negative rights, we're talking about you know, liberty. We're talking about freedom from state interference. We're talking about free speech, freedom of assembly the right to property, right? This is where you have a state that just protects your freedoms, right? Positive rights are where the state actually interferes to guarantee that you enjoy rights that are inalienable. And I think the best example of this, and I'll talk more about it as we go along, is the right to equal opportunity. If you look at uh, John Rawls and you look at Ronald Dworkin, they talk a great deal about justice. And justice for them is all about equal opportunity. And equal opportunity is where the state comes in and it levels the playing field. It's not equal outcomes, it's equal opportunity. Right. And needless to say, if you believe in positive rights, you're going to believe in the desirability of social engineering. Because there's no way you can put positive rights into effect without doing a lot of social engineering. So just to get ahead of myself a bit, if you're doing negative rights only, right, all you want is a state as a night watchman. Here we go. Modus vivendi liberals. Modus vivendi liberals. This is Friedrich Hayek. For anybody who really wants to sort of read a canonical version of modus vivendi liberalism, read Friedrich Hayek. I think Locke fits in the same rough category. Negative rights over positive rights. Modus vivendi or classical liberals really dislike positive rights. I think it's fair to say Hayek hates positive rights. He thinks the state should not be doing social engineering. They loathe social engineering. They make the argument, almost all of them, that not only is it not desirable, but we're not good at it. And that's why we shouldn't do it. You know all the arguments. Republicans make these arguments all the time, that we should let the market decide how to solve problem X or solve problem Y, because markets are much more efficient than the state. When the state gets involved doing anything, it bollockses it up. That's the classical liberal, the modus vivendi liberal view. Progressive liberals, on the other hand, they believe in negative rights, because everybody believes you need the night watchman 
to protect those liberties. But progressive liberals also believe that it's very important for the state to get involved, to do social engineering, to create a level playing field. Right? There are all these positive rights. It's like, just, just think about medical care or health care. Do we believe in health care in the United States? I think the answer is yes. I think if you look at the Republicans, they can't just kill Obamacare. They have to replace Obamacare. Because I think we've reached the point, and I could go into this greater detail in the Q&A if people want, we've reached the point where basically everybody believes that people have a right to universal health care, a right to health care. Right? But once you start talking about a right to health care, you're talking about positive rights. Right? The state's involved in social engineering. And of course, this is why Republicans dislike Obamacare, because the Republicans talk like classical liberals, although I'll make the argument in the short time that they act like progressive liberals. You see, that's the difference between modus vivendi liberals and progressive liberals. It's not that one believes that you can use your critical faculties to reach conclusions about first principles and the other doesn't. I thought that initially, but no. I think that Modus vivendi liberals and progressive liberals have a difference about rights, right? They have a difference about rights and a difference on social engineering. Now, my argument is that with the passage of time, progressive liberalism has trumped modus vivendi liberalism or classical liberalism. Not at the rhetorical level, but in practice. And let me just say a little bit about this. Uh, we have, in the United States, a remarkably powerful state that intervenes in almost all aspects of our life. It's involved in heavy-duty social engineering. And there's no way you can get around that. And the Republicans, just to talk about this in some detail, the Republicans constantly talk about how terrible this is and how they want to change things, and how when they get elected, we're going to let the market do this, and we're going to stop the government from doing that. We're going to get out of the business of doing social engineering. But if you look at how Republicans behave in contrast to Democrats, there's hardly any difference at all. There's no evidence that Democrats spend more money on social engineering than Republicans do. There's no evidence that Democrats create more institutions than Republicans do. The Republicans created the Department of Homeland Security. The Republicans created the Environmental Protection Agency. Ronald Reagan spent one heck of a lot more money on social issues than Barack Obama did. And even in cases where Democrats outspent Republicans, you look at different presidents, it's by tiny margins. So there's just not much difference at all. Uh, there is one political party in the United States that actually truly believes in modus vivendi liberalism. Uh, it's represented by the Libertarian Party. The Libertarians are classical liberals or modus vivendi liberals. No single, no single Libertarian has ever been elected to Congress. And in the 2016 presidential election, the Libertarian received a little over 3% of the vote. So the idea that we have a political party that really represents modus vivendi liberalism and stands a chance of winning is erroneous. It, it's impossible. The Republican Party and the Democratic Party, despite all the rhetoric, are deeply committed to progressive liberalism. That's to say they're deeply committed to social engineering and they're deeply committed to positive rights. You can make the argument that the Democratic Party is more committed than the Republican Party to positive rights, maybe so. But the Republican Party is also committed to positive rights. Now why is this the case? It really all began 
at least in the United States, in the late 1800s. And it's a function of three things. One is the Industrial Revolution, two is nationalism, and three is these huge wars that we fight. Just on the Industrial Revolution, what happened when the United, when the United States really uh, was hit hard with the Industrial Revolution in the late 19th, early 20th century is you had these huge industrial enterprises that came online uh, that did certain things uh, that had huge consequences for people all over the United States and indeed for people all over the planet. And it became very obvious to politicians at the time. And here we're talking about Republicans because you understand that the original progressives in the United States were not Democrats. They were mainly Republicans. Herbert Hoover was a social engineer par excellence. Teddy Roosevelt was a social engineer par excellence. Right? And uh, the reason was that you had to manage this economy. You had to manage these huge industries and figure out rules and regulations. You had all sorts of labor unions, labor problems, child labor problems, and so forth and so on that had to be managed by the state. There's no way you could avoid that. And then, of course, when you start fighting wars, whether it's the American Civil War, World War I, World War II, uh, the state gets involved not only in running those wars, but when the wars are over with, you have to do all sorts of social engineering to reward the people who fought the wars. You remember the GI Bill? The GI Bill is a perfect example.